else here. All right, last week, guys, we were talking about the age of, of ab absolutism. Shut up. And absolutism is uh, this uh, concept, this idea of being dominant, of being in what? sole command. Is that right? There, is that okay? That's good, yeah. No one would fall asleep in here. Um, I have a special lamp. All right, here we are. Um, is becoming the dominant ruler in your country. And so we're going into the 15, 16, 1700s where the European countries have gone out and gained extraordinary wealth, ripping you know, gold and silver out of the ground in South America, cotton, tobacco, and sugar in North America. And with a large reserve of cash, you don't need your nobles. I think the old world kings, royals depended on nobles to police their land for them. They didn't have the cash money to pay them, so they gave them land instead. But after a while, if I give you a house to live in and a plot of land, your grandchildren and great-grandchildren don't remember that I gave it to you. They believe it's theirs. And it causes a lot of problems in Europe. For It's the best system they got for several hundred years. And absolutism kind of breaks old world feudalism. We are now going to return to the divine right of kings. So we're going to start tonight in Mother Russia. Then we're going to go over to Asia and see how they achieved absolutism at the same time. So in Russia, uh, Russia is a little different. Um, west of the Ural Mountains is considered European Russia. And nobody in Europe really liked the Russians because, well, they were Russians. Russia. It's much good, yes. Capitalism is much bad. But anyway, so I prove that comrade. And the two groups that always cause trouble in Russia are the boyars, which are the Russian nobles, and the streltsy, which is the secret police. If you've seen um, Lord of the Rings, the Nazgul, the Dark Riders were created by a guy named Ivan the Terrible, and he loosed them on any enemy, real or imagined. These dark clad, clad riders would show up in the middle of the night, you would disappear, and that's just kind of how we do things in Russia. So eventually, after the death of Ivan the Terrible, there is a period of years known as the Time of Troubles, where Russia was even more chaos than usual. The different boyars were fighting a civil war as to who was going to be the new czar or Caesar of Russia. And when it was all done in 1613, a 17-year-old guy, a high school kid age guy, achieves supremacy. And his name is Michael Romanov. And he will found the great Romanov dynasty that will not fall until 1917, right at the end of World War I. His next two successors, uh, Michael's successors, bring stability to Russia. They kind of calm the chaos that is there. And what Russia's problem is, even still today, is every time Russia gets its head up out of the water, and they can take a deep breath of air, the nobles will reach up, grab Russia by the ankles, and pull it back under. They will not let progress happen because it threatens the established power structure. Well, Peter the Great, coming up, is seen in Russia as a good ruler. Oh, I don't buy batteries. Um, he does do some nice things for Mother Russia, but he achieves them, achieves them through pure violence and nasty. Talk about a ruthless character. This is Peter. Uh, while the country is still um, recovering, instability happens by these boyars who, who want more power and the Streltsy who keep the Tsar safe. And... These groups always want more power, and they will do pretty much whatever it takes to achieve it. They don't want to be rubbed off to the side. They want to stay in their elite position. And when the heirs to the throne, Peter and his twin brother Ivan, are ten, all right, their dad is killed. He is assassinated. And the heirs to the throne are these two ten-year-old boys. And they watch 
their court around you know the, the, the capital happened, there's assassination, there's plot, there's backstabbing, there's assassination attempts on their lives, and they're two ten-year-old boys. Well, sometime in 1689, Ivan, who was older but a little weaker, suddenly dies. He's murdered. Most people think his own brother Peter did it. Peter goes Cain and Abel on Ivan, chokes him to death, and Ivan is dead. And Peter, at ten, is now going to take charge of the Russian state. That is um, how we do things in Russia. He goes to his 19-year-old sister, Sophia, and he exiles her. And he is determined to run um, Mother Russia. I'm going to get this thing to work yet. No, I'm not. Okay. Um, he's going to get Mother Russia to run on his own. And he says, the power of the Russian Tsar, the Russian Caesar, must be kept safe. I can't trust my family, I can't trust the nobles, and I can't trust the Streltsy. So what I need to do is build a big, massive army. An army loyal completely and totally unto me. If I give them their paycheck, they're going to be loyal. The only thing we got in Russia, we got vodka, we got some borscht, we got caviar, we got those stacking dolls, and like Fabergé egg that Danny Ocean steal Ocean 12. So that's all we got. So I got to find a way to make some money. And he says the only way to do that is to do what Western Europe does. What is the Holy Roman Empire doing? What is England doing? What is France doing? And he wants to go over and find out that Peter doesn't trust anybody. He's a pretty smart guy. Like Louis XIV, if you gave him a Mensa test, my man probably would measure out at the genius level. And he decides, well, this isn't a really bright idea, he's going to go over and he's going to find out for himself. So he travels in disguise to some of the shipyards and industrial areas of England and France. Peter's one problem is he's 6'10". <laughs> right? So he's a veritable giant. I mean, 6'10 is big nowadays. So wherever Peter goes, speaking kind of like this with a weird French accent, yes, you know, uh, bonjour, all right? Everybody knows who he is. He just can't hide out. Um, he does work in a British um, shipyard for a long time, and he actually earns the coveted title in England of Master Boatwright. Like, he could build a ship. So he's a pretty smart guy. He's hands-on, but everybody knows who he is. So he gets invited to hang out the powerful nobles and the lords and ladies and royals of Europe. You're Russia. We don't really like you. You're really far away. We only consider you Europe out of, like, courtesy. The other problem with Russia is they have no warm water port. There's no all-year-round access to Russia. And so people say, why would I, like, go there? The place is terrible. They didn't own the Ukraine then. Did not. Did not. Um, so uh, he's going to try here in a little bit. He's going to lose several times. <laughs> hey, you know, right. No, no, no. So... Uh, he's hanging out with the rich and the famous, and the problem with Peter is, once again, he, here he is, he's kind of a handsome guy, got his nice little mustache. I always say he looks like uh, Hollow Notes, one of the one, you know, right? you know, um, got a nice mustache. He could be fancy, um, uh, fashionable when he wanted to. Problem is, <clears throat> The European etiquette is French. It's after Louis XIV, you know, pinky out when you sip your tea and you have 17 spoons and 12 forks and 8 glasses. And Peter's like, well, like God gave you two hands. So like, why do I need like a fork if I can just pick it up and like eat it? So if you've seen the old like Disney movie Beauty and the Beast or Slimer from the old Ghostbusters, everyone else is being dainty and Peter, like, kind of like a teenage kid at like Golden Corral, and there's food flying it's in his hair, in his beard, and you're like, oh my God, who is this Cro-Magnon? Who is this barbarian? My God, he's he's gross. Like why is he um, even here? And so they want to get rid of him. Hey, Peter. 
It's great having you, but if you ever want to go back to Mother Russia, it's that way. If you want to take some engineers with you, go right on ahead. And Peter let it be known that he wanted to build an industry through iron. All right, we have a lot of iron ores going on, Ken. A lot of iron ore, a lot of coal. We can turn that into iron and possibly steel, but I need to know how to do it. I need engineers for the mines. I need to know where to build my smelt smelting plants, where to build this. And Peter tells the engineers, like Ken, hey, I need a little bit of help tweaking these things. Can, can you help me out? Engineers are like, yeah, you're going to pay me, dude. I'm the king of Russia, man. What do you want? Or stacking dolls, Faberge eggs, you name it, we'll find a way to like get it to you. So all these engineers go over and they get there. They're like, all right, man, where are the coal mines you want me to, to like streamline? Well, the truth is, gentlemen, I really don't know where to put the coal mine. So could you help me? You don't even have a mine? You don't have one started? He's like, well, no, I what I thought that I'd bring you over for. And the iron workers are like, hey, where's the plant? Where do you want us to smell? show you how to smelt this iron? Well, guys, I really don't have a factory. Like, if you guys show me where one would, like, fit, I would be more than happy to do that. And they're like, well, no, 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 no. You brought us over here to help you make it more efficient. You didn't say we have to build it from scratch. So most of them leave. And Peter's like, okay, as always, I've got to do this by myself. And this feeds into his absolutism idea. I am the only one in charge. I'm the only one who can do this. And he realizes he's got four main problems that he has to tackle. Number one, how to control the boyers and the Streltsy who don't like this because they're losing power. Number two... I've got to find a way to control the Russian Orthodox Church. They control the hearts and the minds of the people, and I need them not to question me whatsoever. Number three, I've got to organize my government. I would love to do everything myself, but I just can't. And number four, I've got to get some type of economy. Because right now, we're Russia. we got... We got nothing. We can't even suck natural gas out of the Ukraine and claim it as our own. We don't even know where that stuff is. So we got to find a way to pull this off. And so Peter says, well, what am I really good at when I really need something to happen? I know. Pilots. <laughs> All right. I will scare the crap out of people, and they will do exactly what I want, how I want, when I want. So he calls a little meeting. I'm with the nobles as he begins sending all the resources into the military. If I got the military behind me, nobody is going to touch me. So he invites the nobles to his palace for a nice dinner. And Russian boyars were known by two symbols of authority. They had really, really, really long beards that would come to a point and they would hang like little Christmas ball ornaments, kind of like uh, if you've seen the Harry Potter movies, Albus Dumbledore, they were huge. The other thing, they had these long coats with like 70s bell-bottom cuffs, and they were very colorful and vibrant, and they had this nice elegant stitching in them. The beard and the coat sleeve were symbols of Russian nobility. That's who you knew who a boyer was. And the more colorful your outfit, the more powerful you were. Well, Peter has the guys brought in, he serves the borscht, um, he's passing around the vodka, and all of a sudden the doors slam shut, clunk, 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 mm -hmm. and his soldiers come in. Peter says, gentlemen, we're here to do things one way, and that is mine. And he pulls out a pair of sheep shears, and he grabs several of their beards, and he cuts it off. Then he goes around and physically rips the sleeves off of several of the boyers' jackets. The soldiers are there. Everybody lines up. Their beard is cut. Their sleeves are ripped. He said, you're no longer a boyer. Like, Boy, are you out of here. All right? All right. That was terrible. That was bad. So he uh, just destroys the symbols of noble authority right then and there, brutally and quickly. And if a couple protest, they don't show up the next day. They are gone. And in 1722, he creates a thing known as the Table of Ranks. 
He says, your social privileges in the new Russia are going to be tied to your military rank. The higher your military rank, the more powerful and more privileges you have. General, Colonel, Major, Captain, First Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant, here it is. But, this is a theme of these new absolutists, the greater your rank, the greater your power, the greater your responsibility, the better you behave. Standards are higher. The higher rank you climb, more is entrusted to you, but you better do it right. Colonel, you better do it right. All right? <laughs> James is going to hear about it. She's not going to be happy with you. All right? So with great power comes great responsibility. So I'll give it to you. But you are held to a higher standard than everyone else because you're supposed to know better. And so now, even the commoner has a chance of social mobility in Russia. The old boyars, they no longer exist. Nobody cares about them. In the Streltsy, Peter's own bodyguards, when he's over in Europe, those idiots, they honest to God, planned a little coup. He says, no, 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 no. So he has about 2,000 of them come out in front of the palace, that today would be the Red Square. And this is one of the legends why it's called the Red Square in Moscow. And as the guys are standing there on a brutal January morning, the army comes up. Peter starts walking around, starts saying, Gentlemen, you know, the other night I had that dinner with the uh, nobles. Some of them were a little beardless. <laughs> I must be mistaken, but I heard that when I was over there in France, parlez vous that some of you actually wanted to overthrow me. Is that true, Lonigan? Is that true? No, sir. Doc, you sure about that? No, no, sir. Well, Peter walks around with a sword, and he starts lopping heads off. When he's done, he and his men kill 1,200 of the 2,000 Streltsy. The other 800 have to stand there overnight. And Peter says, the bodies, leave them here so people know when you mess with me, this is what happens. <laughs> yes, sir. Peter, Peter, Peter. <laughs> so goal number one, done. The boyers are gone. The Strelts, he's terrified. And Peter is pumping resources into his military. This is what happens when you make good old Peter angry. And now there's the church. And the church which was not supposed to be under the thumb of the nobles, always was. And Peter says, if I get the priests and the bishops speaking against what Peter called Western modernization, and while he's violent and horrible and terrible and kind of psychotic, if you're a normal Russian citizen, he's trying to get rid of feudalism, and he's trying to modernize Russia, which is at least 200 to 300 years behind everybody else. He's trying to bring them in to the modern day, like right before the big industrial revolution. How do we get ourselves out of this pit of feudalism? But the priests start telling the people in their churches and congregations that what I'm doing is wrong. No one's going to listen. So Peter takes over the church. He appoints the leader to be what's called a synod. He makes the church a part of his governmental bureaucracy and appoints a buddy, a non-religious person, as being in charge. There's no pope, there's no archbishop of Canterbury, there's no patriarch of Constantinople. My man Ken Barnett is now in charge of the church. Ken's my boy, Ken and I talk, Ken's going to tell the church what I want them to do. And so now he controls what the clergy is doing. Almost down to early on what sermons they were going to hear in church on Sunday. It's almost like state-run like religion. This is what you're going to say. This is what you're going to do. This is the message that I want. And so, third up is how to organize his government. And the boyers were just about as violent as Peter was. And so if... A boyer got up in a meeting, okay guys, we need to reorganize, we need to restructure, we got to do this better and faster to beat our, our competition. Um, John, do you have any, any ideas? You know, John was afraid to speak because if he did, he may make his boss, the colonel over here, look bad. And the colonel would come by and John would disappear. 
So nobody would say anything. They were all mute, like, you know, sitting in uh, class with Ferris Bueller, teacher going, Bueller, Bueller, and no one said anything. So Peter says, no. The problem is we have department heads, we have managers, we have presidents, we have vice presidents. So he goes to Sweden and adopts the Swedish system of government, which says, okay, you're my defense ministry, you're my department of state, you're all equals. Everybody in here is of equal rank. If you have an idea, I want to know what it is. I want to remove that bureaucratic pressure of my boss or my manager or my department head chain of command. I, Peter, when I come in, if you want to know something or you have an idea, let me know. You are all on a level playing field. You have a few good ideas, I'll bump you up somewhere else. But in here, you're all equal. I need ideas. I'm getting old people. I'm tired. I can't do this all by myself. And Peter's ministries and his government were, there was four of them, just like everybody else, a very small group that he can meet with every single day. I can't talk to 52 people for hours a day, but I can talk to four. And Peter wants to know everything that's going on. He is hands-on. He's got to manage everything. Now, down in the local villages, just like Peter the Great in France, um, just like Spain, what you guys do at the local level, I don't care. Police the people, collect taxes, you know, serve judgments. If the stoplight at Homestead and high school is out, that's not my problem. You fix it, Mark. I need to take care of the entire picture. All right? i got to take care of the country as a whole. And so things begin to get better in Russia. Department Ministry of Taxation, Department Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who were we friends with, who were we going to Defense Ministry number three, war with, war and the army, and last but not least, the big one, the Russian economy. Does it have a pulse? All right, do we, are we limping along? Do we have absolutely anything? And so Peter tries this idea um, as the government is working, of trying to get an iron manufacturing system going. Not only to equip his army, but to, but to build large vehicles of war. Not just like, you know, bayonets and rifles, but cannons and ships. And just things that we can really, really, really use. Man, he builds it. He's like, man, I built this thing. It's got all this awesome power. But I don't just want to leave it in the garage. I want to take it out and see... I want to get out there on I-40 and just lay into it and hope the highway patrol isn't out there. Or I really want to see how fast, maybe head down, you know, uh, I-40 towards Wilmington and just open it up a, a little bit. And the other thing he needs is a warm water port. Why is Vladimir Putin taking over the Ukraine? Well, in 1999, the Russian, I still say Soviet, excuse me, um, lease on Stevisopol was up in the Russian Navy was supposed to be out of there. Access to the Black Sea gives you access to the Aegean and the Mediterranean. <coughs> well, if you go to Stavisopol right now, what is still there? Russian. The Russian fleet, all right? Ukraine is key not only for natural gas, but to have access to international shipping, Mediterranean, Suez Canal, Indian Ocean, so on and so forth. Peter was locked in. I need a warm water port. Who's got one? He looks around. There's one down south in Stevisopol, Yalta. Problem is, it's part of the Ottoman Empire at this time, all right? Which is, is modern day Ukraine. I go down there, and I'm going I'm I'm to get that thing. But I want to give my boys a little scrimmage match. I want to warm them up first. Who can we probably take? Sweden. Polvos, great. Neutral balls. Meatballs and like Legos. All right. Fish. All right. So sweet Swedish fish. All right. I will go. I'm gonna go test it out against Sweden. All right. I'm gonna give them a, a beating. And unbelievably, he loses. Niet, niet, no good. Uh, no. Boy, saddle up, we're gonna try again in 1703. And he loses again. Like, well, I can't lose your Sweden. There's like eight of you. All right? Cross-country ski like demons, what the hell, man? Like, how do we lose to Sweden? 
But he gets enough territory that he does another thing absolute monarchs do. When we want to show off how cool and powerful we are, big armies are great, but we want to live in style. Now, Louis built Versailles, which is awesome. So Peter builds a smaller version of Versailles, but he builds an entire city around it. And in St. Petersburg, because when you're the emperor, you can name stuff after yourself, he builds the famous Romanov Winter Palace. If for whatever reason you decide to go to Russia, the one place I would recommend going is St. Petersburg. The palace is gorgeous. Um, the outside is kind of like these mauvish orange like backgammon tiles that when the sun hits it kind of reflects. It's this nice green, like forest green, emerald green color on the outside. Absolutely gorgeous and, and opulent. Other than that, turn around and then get out of there, all right? Um, but um, St. Petersburg is, is beautiful. So, now that he's gotten his city built in like, you know, a swamp, it's okay. We warmed up twice. We haven't done real good, but now we're going to make our halftime adjustments. Now we're going for the Ottoman Empire. And he tries, and he loses several wars with them. Try as he might, he's just not modern enough. The Russian men, they'll try hard, and a lot of them will die, but they just... All right. It's not going to happen. So, but Peter, unfortunately is so focused on doing all of these things, he was one of those guys that if he wasn't there, nothing happened. He goes to A, okay guys, we're going to put a coal mine here, this is how you mine the coal, this is how you brace up the walls, this is a little mine cart, okay, I'm going to go over the iron smelting plant, this is how we're going to smelt the iron ore out, we're going to need some coal, this is called a blast furnace, and we're going to do this, now that it's molten, we're going to put it in bars, and we're going to ship it over here, and we're going to make stuff with it, well, when he's at sea, all the guys back in the coal mine are, what to do? I don't know. We dug a hole and we put the boards. Do we go straight? Do we go left? Do we go right? We don't even, I got right left backwards. We must wait for Peter. And then Peter would come back. What are you guys doing? Well, Peter, we did not know. We're like a road crew. We could go straight. We could go. Well, I don't know where the coal is. Well, I thought you would tell us. Afraid to make a mistake. So, unless Peter was standing there, nobody did, did anything. So he uses up enormous amounts of energy. He's like Sisyphus rolling that rock up the hill. He's like, ah, can't you guys think? Well, what this thing? I don't know. I'm much good at telling me do. I, I don't even know. So, that's what goes on. And while he reigns for an incredible 43 years, which was longer than the Russians' life expectancy, what he doesn't do is train a successor. He's so busy doing things that he doesn't train his descendants on how to do it all. So when Peter the Great dies in 1725, his son is pretty young, who's been real angry on the sidelines for about 30, 40 years now, the Boyers. And the Boyers reassert their control. They grab Russia by the ankles and pull it back down underneath the ooze as advisors to the new czar. Um, we're going to help you out, young man, and slowly increase our power. So while he's violent and kind of psychotic, Peter really helps Russia. He almost has them modernized, but when he dies, there's no one with his energy, his charisma, his focus, his vision, and Russia slides back almost to where they started from. So, guys like Peter, it's kind of crazy, but I kind of like Peter. I'm not doing much, all right? The whole choking your brother thing is a bit much. Like, that really happened, and I don't mind Peter. Yes, ma'am. So, I know this is probably pretty obvious, but a warm water port, are the cold water ports all frozen? They're frozen for um, four to five months of, um, of the year. So, but can you guys sell stuff to me? Well, no, man, we can't get there. And, well, can you come over land? God, no. Like, why would we do that? I'm not going over there. So that was it. So now we're going to flip on over into Asia. We're going to, God, this thing, I keep pretending it still works. Um, um, absolutism in Asia. Uh, you know why it might not work? Because ah, I'm brilliant, like Peter. I 
plug it in, it just might actually <laughs> work. Hey, all right, look at that. I'm good with technology. Build me that really technological high school, parents. I'm, yeah. I'm all over. You saw that right here. Man, yeah. I'm a genius. Figured it out, though. Problem solving. That's right. right. I did. All right. All right. All right. This handsome young guy is named Akbar um, the Great. And in the late 1300s, this massive force came across Asia known as the Mongols. I call it the Mongol boomerang. They start in China. They go all over Asia, up into Russia, down into the Middle East. They start the Black Plague, like hurling bodies over on the wall in Yalta, on the Crimean Peninsula, in the Ukraine. And then some of the Mongols actually convert to Islam. And two cousins have this major battle in Saudi Arabia, and the Christian world was pumped. Oh my God, if this guy Hulagu wins, he's going to wipe out all the Muslims. We didn't even need those crusades. This is fantastic. And he's going up against his cousin Burke, who he's beaten since childhood and everything they've done. And Burke, who has converted to Islam, wins. It's an upset victory. And one of Burke's descendants, a half Turkish, half Mongol warlord named Tamerlane, goes, finishes the boomerang and goes back across southern Asia into India. And he was a psychopath. He was after pure conquest. He was never accepted in the Mongol world because he was Muslim, and never accepted in the Muslim world because he was Mongol. And in his wake, he leaves like pestilence and death and destruction. He's like a giant dementor that just destroys things. And he gets to India. And here he sets up shop in the northern part of India where he will found what is known as the Mughal dynasty. 1526, the Mughals come to power, and they're looking at the incredible diversity of India, and in distance, in language, in um, ethnicity, in the polytheistic religion, and there's Hinduism there, and there's the caste system, he's like, my God, this place is a mess. And slowly but surely, the Mughals, one of the great gunpowder empires, because they came to power using, you know, um, uh, muskets and cannons takes root and a guy a visionary I put him first because Akbar is so far ahead of everybody else in the same time frame and so most of these guys like Akbar and the Habsburgs are living concurrently with each other all these guys are within a hundred or 150 years of, the, of each other so across the world absolutism is in Russia England France Spain India, Turkey, China, and Japan. And Akbar is the greatest Mughal ruler. He rules for a long time. All these guys are Jedi leaders. They, they rule for 30, 40, 50 years. And they've got vision and they have ideas and like great chess players. If we do this now, it will reciprocate in the future and it will pay off for my empire like this. And what makes Akbar so strange is in an era where religion tore people apart, Catholic, Protestant, Sunni, Shiite, you name it, he's like, you know, let's sit down and take a look at this. And Akbar is so wealthy at this time, he is as powerful, if not more powerful, than any absolute monarch on the planet, from Japan to Spain, Akbar is living. He is right in the middle of the Silk Road. He's got money coming in from both ends. He's living large. And while he was a conqueror, he expanded his, his empire. He made several different uh, decisions. Number one, he promised his people honest, good government. When you are in India, we will be honest, we will be good. We will try and take care of you. And his goal was to end the division between Hindu and Muslim, which we know didn't resolve itself until the current day. Yes, 1948, you know, Pakistan was created. Well, it didn't really help all that much. So there's tension there to this very day. And Akbar works with the diversity of his empire. He marries a Hindu princess. He appoints Hindus to key governmental positions. And his contemporaries, the Muslims, were like, what are you doing? 
you can't have those guys in here because, well, they're Hindu. And Akbar says, look, there's several problems with... What are they doing? I don't even know. Floor. 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 Now. Right. That's how we roll. So anyway, all right. Um, he said there's several problems when converting India to Islam. Number one, Hinduism is an old river valley religion. It's been around for a long time. Islam, at six, seven hundred years, is a relative new newcomer, say a thousand years. Number two, Hinduism is polytheistic, and we're monotheistic. And in the Islamic world, there was social mobility. You could move you know, upward in society, especially if you were a merchant. And in India, Hinduism, there's the caste system. And part of the caste system was created as a way to justify your social position. If you're in a low-born caste, well, you're there because of what you did. You can't cry about it because you put yourself there. I am up here on the cat because I actually lived a better life than you did the time before. So I will hold you down while I stay in power. Now these Muslims show up. If I'm a low caste Hindu, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Allah, Allah. What do I got to do? Five things. That's all I got to do. And I'm all over that. Or if I can't get to Mecca, I'm down. Let's do this. All right. And so there's big social division. Yeah, you know, pray five times a day, face east, can do that. Yep. Yeah. Tied four, I can do that. Let me think. Um, you know, Ramadan, 40 days is a long time, but I'm fat. I'll probably make it. Yeah, all right, let's do this. All right. This, this I can do. So his goal is to try and solve that. And so he takes Alexander the Great has done this. William the Conqueror has done this. He says, let's get a census. I need to find out who lives where, how many resources you consume, and how much you produce. If you live in a big city and you consume a lot of resources, too bad, you're going to pay more taxes. If you're in a very profitable area, you know what? I may have you pay a little more to balance out these poor country bumpkins down here who don't have enough. It's only, in his mind, fair. And one of the things he did was he removed a special tax on non-believers. If you were not Muslim, you had to pay more. Now, because Muhammad studied with um, Jewish rabbi and Christian bishops, peoples of the book didn't have to pay that much, but they still had to pay. If you were a polytheist, you're paying through the nose. And Akbar says, you know what? It's, no. All right, we're, we're, we're going to get rid of that. We're all in India together. This is how we're going to how we're going to do this. And what I think he does is incredible, is he brings together Christian priests from the Silk Road, Buddhist monks, Hindus, Jewish rabbi, um, you know, Islamic imam, and he has them sit in a room. It's this big plush room, and he has tea served, and he shuts all the doors, and he sends his guards away. He says, I brought you all here, because what I want to do, since the Silk Road is running right through my land, is let's look at each individual religion or belief system. Even Confucian scholars were invited from, from China. And I want to find out, let's look at what we have in common rather than what we have that divides us. So in the Hebrew Ten Commandments, you got you shouldn't lie, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't kill. And you, this Mahariva Hindu guy, you have kind of the same thing. And in Buddhism, you've got the Eightfold Path. Do the right thing, think the right thing, right thoughts, right action, right speech. Well, that's kind of like the little Ten Commandments here. And as a Muslim, like we kind of build on that. So it appears to me that whatever religion you're in, to be a good person is kind of the, like you got to do the same stuff. So let's look at more of what unites us rather than what divides us, and let's try and figure out how to work with that. And magically, when Akbar is alive, India is rocking. People from all over the world move there. The Venetian sailors from um, Italy show up. The Portuguese show up. Um, the Spanish will be like, oh, God, Portuguese, Spanish. No, 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 no. And while Akbar is alive, everything's fine. Silk Road, ideas. Culture, glass, horses, um, gunpowder, 
Um, you name it, is going back and forth across Europe, Africa, and Asia. And it is really the first big, like, global economy rocking and rolling right there. And then, Akbar dies. And his two successors, his son and grandson, if you try to create bigger idiots, I don't know that you could. I mean, they are just, whatever grandpa and dad did, they did not pay um, attention. Um, Akbar has, again, the charisma, the vision, the staying power to unite everybody. Well, his um, grandson does away with all of his laws. All that freedom of worship done. I'm going to reinstate the head tax, and I'm going to make it even heavier. All of you Hindus who converted to Islam, you may have to leave. And along with the poor people who converted to Islam, it was a lot of the Indian merchants, right? The Arabs are the great movers and shakers of the Silk Road, so if I want to make money, I will convert. It makes the whole process easier. He kicks them out, costing himself money. And his um, grandson is a guy named Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan is literally the richest man in the world. He had wealth even more so than the Habsburgs. He decorated palaces, at least four, with diamonds and rubies the size of basketballs. Just because he could. Like, he, could. Um, he had a golden um, tiger that when you pulled its tail, it had like these giant like Iron Maiden spikes. And if you displeased him, they would bring you in and they would shove your head in the golden tiger's mouth. He would pump it up and down, kind of like a bicycle pump, and it would like maim you. I mean, he just had solid gold. Does it need to be gold? Can't you find anything else? And he builds castles all over. He says, you know what my lovely bride needs? She needs a nice place. And unfortunately... She died. So he builds for her the beautiful Taj Mahal. What most people don't know is on the other side of the river, he was building an all-black one for himself. And his building projects and his wanton decoration begins to sap the great Incan treasury. So to get money, he has the world's worst idea. There were these guys sailing around the Indian Ocean. Spitz bought Cheerio, God Save the Queen, and all that cricket bats, and West Ham, and Manchester at Wembley, whatever the soccer teams are called. All right, Beatles, spoon day, all right. They're like, hey, mate, do you mind if we, like, dock in your little ports here? Well, what do you want to do that for? Well, let's look, we'll rent them from you. And that way, when, like, you bring goods to market, to, like the farmer's market in Carborough, and they're fresh, we'll buy them. Like we'll make scads of money, and we'll pay you for it, and then we'll take them back to England. Shah Jahan says, well, how much are you going to pay me? I don't know how much you want. I don't know how much is a lot to you guys. A couple shillings. Ooh, shilling sounds good. And they get them dirt cheap at the source from India, and then they sell it stuff for mega bucks. Um, back in London, especially the tea. Heck, they take the tea, and they go over, uh, or poppies is what they're really after. They take the poppies from India, and they give it to the Chinese for tea and silver, and the Chinese are getting stones. They're thinking, wow, man, this medicine you give us is really good. And the British are making, oh, my God, we're making 100% profit. We're not even really like doing anything. This is the greatest get-rich Ponzi scheme of, of, of all time. And Shah Jahan lets him in. And then the British want a little more. And they want a little more. And then they begin, um, you know, instigating Hindu and Muslim wars. And when the two sides are done fighting, the British bring their troops over and they carve out a little more territory. And slowly but surely, the British will take over India because Shah Jahan wanted to build two nice buildings and bankrupt the <coughs> empire. So I am not an India Pale Ale guy. This is too bitter for me. I don't like it. But if you don't know, now you can you know, 
plot this out at your next little, you know, IPA, like, cool kid, like, hipster with glasses with no glass in that meeting. <laughs> and he said, you know what, and why it's called an IPA. Well, the British, when they're stationed in India, want beer. But by the time they get it from England down to India, it's bad, it's spoiled, so they got to find a way to preserve it. So they take more hops, and they throw it in there, and it kind of bleaches out the dark British ale, but it preserves it even in its warm state. And so the British soldiers were happy in India. They could now have their ale that they called an India Pale Ale because it took like nine months to get from England to India. All thanks to Shah Jahan. So, absolutism, awesome empire in India for a brief time, and then they collapse. And that brings us to this one, the longest lasting one. This is the one that you guys, I think, will like the most. Very long, long absolute empire from the 1300s all the way till the end of World War I. This is a 600 year old empire who controlled land on three continents the modern Rome, Asia, Africa, and India. The great Ottoman Empire in what is today Turkey. Of the three great gunpowder empires, the Ottomans are the most dominant and the most powerful. And they have two big sultans, two big absolute kings, Mayhed II and Suleiman the Magnificent, that are, you know, just all, not quite right after each other, but very close. And Mayhed or Mehmet is known as the conqueror. He goes around from the Middle East to Africa to southeastern Europe, just cracking skulls, right? He is a warrior, a Seljuk Ottoman warrior. And the Seljuks were part of um, this old Turkish army that they're the only ones who resisted the Mongol hordes. And they were like the Aztecs. They were the strong-armed thugs for a previous ruler. They're like, you know what? Why are we doing all this, like, for somebody else? Why don't we just kill them and take over? And the guys were like... Yeah, solid, all right? Let's do it. So um, they do. The Seljuk warriors are tough, they're, they're violent, and they turn themselves into the Ottoman Empire. And some of the things they do, kind of sick again, but also brilliant in, in a way. And Mehmet is able to break the old age-old tradition of tribal chieftains. In the Turkish Arabic world, you were... Your family, your tribe, was the most important thing. It was the precedent. People had a hard time envisioning a united empire as a whole. You looked after your own local self-interest. And a word of allegiance only lasted while both parties were alive. So if Leanne and I make a pact and one of us dies, well, the other family is free from the pact. It's all, it's all good. And Mayhat destroys that. He says, no, we need to be unified, all right? It's like you take your hand and your fingers and you strike a board, you're going to break a couple of your fingers. But if you turn it into a fist and you hit that same board, now you're united. We're going to be stronger. You know, that's how you have to think about it. Watch me. I promise this is going to work. We're going to capture Constantinople together. They're like, man, we've been trying to get Constantinople for like 700 years. Literally, for 700 years, we've been trying to get Constantinople. He's like, I know, but we've gone about it the wrong way. Let's all work together. Lo and behold, 1453, the stronghold, the ancient Byzantine stronghold of Constantinople, who's held out against Muslims for 800 years, falls. And Mayhem goes in trying to show honor. He says, you Byzantines are a worthy opponent. I will let you live. Emperor, you may go. And the emperor says, well, an emperor without Constantinople might as well be dead. So you might as well just kill me. And he said, well, okay. Boom. I gave you a shot. You're done. So the Muslims now have Constantinople, and they rename it Istanbul. I could throw a bad world history joke here. It's oh, yeah. what I tell my students when they really make me mad. You know what? I just, it's stand your bull, Lonigan. Yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, all right. 
Yeah. See if you guys are still awake. That one is bad. That one is bad. Yeah, that one is bad. Right. I mean, that, that was, yeah, that's right. unforgivable. All right, here we go. All right, I'll stop for the night. I'll stop and throw that in. They do got some cool hats, though. Like, I don't know if I would look good in this, but, you know, this you know, guy, you know, it's, it, it's not bad. So the Ottomans uh, are now in charge, and Mahan's a smart guy. He understands that war is fine, but most people are happy when they have a job, and they've got something to eat, and they've got a little bit of money. So he starts talking with the European Italian trading states, Venice, Naples. It is all about making money. And then he says, what we need to govern this empire, and he's the first one to think of this, is a set of laws. It's known as the Kunami. And he says, you know, somebody does something wrong, and then we punish them. And the punishments are inconsistent. So what I want to do is write up a rule book that is preventative in nature. I want everyone to know this is right and this is wrong. And if you do the wrong, this is going to be your punishment. Let's try and get ahead of the game and define what is right and wrong in our society, then do it after the fact. And so he begins to put this together, and what he needs is the almost all-powerful Islamic ulama. An ulama is like an Islamic bishop. They were the original writers. They took what Muhammad's message was. They wrote it into the Quran. And whether you are a Shiite Muslim or a Sunni Muslim, everybody listened to the, the, to the ulama. And they actually taught many of the people in an Islamic university called a madrasa how to read, how to write, how to do math. And they help create a banking system, the use of the check, using the decimal point, buying things on credit. And all of this education was free. And the Europeans from the Crusaders, Knights Templar, whomever from on up, kind of copied this system and they spread it to China and up into Europe. So if you want to you want to control the people, like Peter the Great, you got to control the hearts and the minds. David Petraeus, before he's sleeping with spies, <laughs> no offense to good old David, um, all right, when the hearts and the minds, well, the way to do that is you control the church. If you can control the church, people are going to um, listen to you. And so, Mayhead gets this thing rolling, and shortly after his death, he get this guy, the, the grand daddy of them all, uh, Ottoman emperor. His name is Suleiman the um, Magnificent. And he is the last really big expansionist emperor. He takes people all the way up into modern day Hungary and Austria and over as far as um, Iraq and Afghanistan and over into Africa. So he is like a, just a big heavy hitter. And Suleiman, when he's done, probably is militarily the most powerful absolute monarch of his time. More powerful than the Habsburgs in Spain, than Queen Elizabeth in England, Louis XIV. His guys, even though he's gone, hammer Peter the Great repeatedly. So the Ottomans have this, this brief moment where they are untouchable in the world, almost. And Suleiman, much like Peter the Great, Organized, he, he's a military guy, so he likes efficiency, he likes order. Just like Peter's table of ranks, your social position is now dependent upon your military rank. General, Colonel, Major, Captain, Lieutenant. The more power you have, the greater your responsibility. But also, just like Peter, you are subjected to stricter discipline. Mark, your mom comes home. The dishwasher's not unloaded, the counter's a mess, and dinner's not cooked. It may be Anna and Joy's fault, but who's going to get yelled at? You are. Why? I'm the oldest. Well, you're supposed to know better, all right? <laughs> Why didn't you do it? All right, so there it is. You're supposed to know better, so you've got more power, but you better carry yourself correctly. Because if I brought you up, I could knock you straight back down. So, just um, be careful. He has a little twist, a little onion twist to the hat. That would get annoying. It's supposed, to, it's supposed to have kept you cool. I don't care. I'm not wearing that. Like, I'm going to go do my own thing. 
I'm, I'm just not. How did they make it? It's silk, believe it or not. And a little wooden frame, and then silk. And it had to be awkward with the wind, what, the wind blow it off? Like you would think you're out there holding that thing? I don't know. I don't know how to hang it on that. I don't know. I could go over there and like find one. Throw that thing off. But anyway, so. Anybody watch Better Late Than Never? I think I ask this every week. No? Bradshaw and Foreman and Shatner go, okay, well, anyway. I have seen that. It's pretty good. So they go over to Morocco and like it's just it's hysterical. Well, if you're that old and rich, you can just pretty much do whatever you want. And, you know, if they get mad, you just. Disappear. But anyway, um, much like everybody else, we're going to have a small, very controlled bureaucracy. Very tight, very small, very controlled. Suleiman wants his palace in his court, his advisors, was a ministry in and of itself. His territory was so big, he needed tons and tons and tons of workers, and he needed them organized. So there was a chief of staff in his palace, where he operated from. He needed an administrative branch. He's going to decide what happens, but I need you guys to go and carry it out. I don't want excuses. I don't care how you do it. Just get it. Just get it accomplished. Mm -hmm. The military, that was his thing. I need to know how many soldiers we have, what do we need, what's the training schedule like, what weapons do we need, and I'm going to take care of that personally. Last but not least, he needs a head of religion. A synod, like Peter the Great, I need one of my buddies to keep in contact with the ulama and the mosques and the madrasas. I want to know what they're talking about so I can help control it. And with this, he covers this massive multicultural um, empire. And by dominating the religious institutions, that's what gives, besides his military might, Suleiman the most um, power. But he's smart. Unlike everybody else, um, Suleiman knows sooner or later he's going to need to train a successor. And he looks at what he's doing. He's controlling everything from the tiny village school in the tiny little province to the giant madrasa. Everybody is getting the same state message. With this, the Ottomans claim that they follow Suleiman's interpretation of the Sharia the original Islamic law that he folds into Mayhead's Kunami, this preventative law book. He said, look, this is what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and it's a gift to you people. It's a preventative and functional code of law helping streamline and organize our society. I know it might look to you guys like I'm a, a total control freak trying to tell you what to do, what to do, and how to, but really it's not. Like this is for you, all right? I'm telling you, you're really going to love this process. And as a result, as he controls the minds of the people, his monarchy is pretty solid. Things kind of run smooth. And then he has his leadership ideas, and this is kind of, part of it is kind of smart. The Chinese will do the same thing as we'll see here in, in, in a minute. Um, he takes his sons, and even his nephews, and he has them taken out to small rural villages. And they learn how to govern and manage a village. When they get older, 15, 20, then they move up to a little bigger town and eventually to a little bigger city. And they're studied and, and evaluated by Ulama and, and some of his um, assistants. And the better you do, the more power you get. And what he wants them is to have management experience, decision-making experience. One of you are going to be the next sultan. So I can't just throw you into the job. You're going to be taught how to do it. Then you're going to go out and actually do it in these small villages and bigger towns and cities. And near the sultan's death, right, the fun begins. Now, technically, like everybody else, the Ottoman sultan is a theocratic entity, a religious ordained government. Allah picks the sultan. Of all the Muslims in the world, Allah reaches his hand down and picks one. And that one will be the next sultan. But how do we decide who is that next one if we've got 15, 20 competitors? Well, the Ottomans had a combination of survivor meets the Hunger Games. It was outwit, outplay, outlast. And the brothers 
had to either themselves assassinate or murder their brothers, or invent some sort of tactical trap and scheme to get them trapped and kill them. The last brother standing was the next sultan. It sounds horrible, but it's no good.